My name is Peter Merrill. I'm here with Robin Dunbar. We're going to talk about the fuss that's been made about his numbers in the Agile world. And perhaps we're going to put that into a clearer context. Good. Pleasure to be with you. I hate to start with the number. We should talk more about uh, all of the numbers. Yes, it's, it's, it's really a scale of, of numbers um, that have a very distinct scaling ratio to each other. So uh, the scaling ratio is three so that uh, each number in the series is three times the size of the one inside it. And the most layer of five, who are kind of like your uh, uh, intimate friends, maybe in, in, in the next layer out, that would add up to about 15. And the, these, these layers are all inclusive. So the, that layer of 15 includes your five inner core best friends, as it were, and so on through 50, 150. And technically, it goes on beyond that. The, the, the 150, which has become known as Dunbar's number, is in some ways critical because it does differentiate between people you have meaningful relationships with and people you have more casual relationships with. So when it comes to work groups? It depends entirely on the purpose of the work group. Most team sports and many kind of inner cabinets and a few odds and sods like that have a typical number somewhere between about 11, uh, obviously cricket, and uh, 15, obviously rugby. <laughs> um, mm. And they sort of oscillate in, in, in that sort of space. 15 seems to be demarcating up a limit beyond which you can't go. And except for Aussie. That, <laughs> except for, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, the, the essence of it is, if you think of it in, say, soccer terms, um, your ability to function as a team really depends on each person knowing exactly what everybody else is going to do. What seems to set the limit on that is simply our capacity to handle uh, relationships of that quality or intensity, whatever word you want to use for it, where we, we really understand how that other person or those other people think. And I kind of always think with, with rugby that the fact that at 15, they've started to split the game into two separate games, obviously the forwards mm -hmm. and the backs. It's beginning to crack up a bit at that point and some substructuring needs to be done. There's something to be said for six when it comes to knowledge work because six is three pairs. Pairs are a nice unit of, of collaboration and um, it's two triples, which is a nice unit of uh, uh, mutual learning. Um, yeah. But the next two numbers, that seems to be something that gets left out of the conversation. People jump to this 150 number uh, and, and they neglect the 50. You can see what the 15 and the 150 are doing, if you like, in, in terms of your everyday life. One is your kind of sympathy group, the people you feel very bonded to, whereas the people in the sort of 150 outer layers, as it were, are really people you perhaps only see once a year, you know, perhaps might give them even a phone call at Christmas just to catch up with them. That intermediate 50 layer seems to be, you know, a much, a somewhat more casual group, social group uh, from that point of view. That may be the big difference with the business context in that you could make a little business unit out of 150, but the problem is everybody else has got some baggage back home. You have to make allowance that. That may well be why m most functional work groups are going to be in the 50 region rather than the 150 region. And the big difference between the 150 and the, the, the 500 uh, layer is really willingness to be altruistic towards people. If, if somebody in, inside your 150 says, could you help me out? You're going to say on the whole, yes. And you're not going to kind of top up, well, you know, he didn't pay me back last time when I helped him out. You'll do it simply because of the relationship. It's the people in the next layer out that are likely to say no or are likely to say, well, yes, but, you know, only if you help me out uh, next week, as it were. Those numbers probably do reflect the kind of quality of the task. You know, if, it's a re if you really need to be able to think how, how Jim thinks in order to get your bits to work together, then it's going to have to be a very small group. In Agile, to try and mitigate this problem of knowing to know how Jim thinks. We established little contracts using automated tests. So basically right. the acceptance criteria for a task, the mission 
that's handed off to Jim uh, is right. nicely constrained. Uh, that mission command dynamic works through a network of peers, so we can all be communicating to each yes. other using this stuff. You know, that, that in itself is actually constraining uh, the size of alliance you can have because yes. each of these layers in our natural social networks requires the investment of very specific amounts of time. And, and the closer you come in, the smaller the number, the more time has to be invested in the relationships within that circle to get the circle to work, to cohere and be cohesive uh, in the way that it needs to be. So, you know, if, if you've got fast churn on tasks, it's almost going to force you into uh, having smaller groups simply because uh, you won't have time to build up uh, you know, the yes. sort of integrated. Perhaps kind of when you, you see people saying, well, Dunbar's number is 150, therefore we're going to split our business up into groups of 150. What sorts of problems come from taking these numbers out of context and using them in an arbitrary way like that? I think the 150 is simply a structural unit, probably its most important thing in business terms, is a structural unit for, into which you might consider breaking up your enormous multinational. <laughs> you know, this is exactly what the military do for exactly this reason. <laughs> the whole thing is this hierarchical structure. With all the three running right the way through from top to bottom, you know, yes. from the biggest brigades and divisions right down to, to, to you know, the level of the section within a platoon. It's all uh, uh, multiples of three all the way through. But it seems to be, what seems to be important about it is that everybody within a unit of that size, 150, well, let's say up to about 200 maximum, uh, mm -hmm. everybody knows who everybody is. That seems to be the key to it. So yes. you kind of, you, you don't have to have sort of formal management structures you know you, I mean, the classic case of this is Gore-Tex I and mean, that, that's their factory standard factory size right unit size mm -hmm. and they everybody in the factory has the same label on their jacket it just says Gore-Tex associate because everybody knows who the factory manager is everybody knows who the uh, floor sweeper is everybody knows who the accountant is everybody knows who the sales team are yes. and so on and so forth and uh, and everything can be done by personalized relationships go beyond the 150 then you need real formal structures and you need labels <laughs> but as a way to hand up missions that then each of these structures would break down into smaller missions that they could then hand the smaller yes, missions. Exactly. Yeah, exactly so exactly so yeah a thin red line type battles you know there's sort of mm. two armies lined up with wings and centers and all this oh. kind of thing and your problem is you know how to coordinate the various segments in your line of battle, you know, yes. you don't want the the left wing charging off and disappearing over the horizon. You've got to somehow keep them, you know, coordinated with the others. So autonomy does you no good without alignment. Um, <laughs> the problem with the damned cavalry who are always on the wing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they would, they would you no, know, you know, and then they'd not stop. Very good, Robin. Well, look, I, I, I think I've taken up a lot of your time. Thank you so much for it. Um, Pleasure. And okay. <laughs> lovely. Excellent. Very good.